afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our final class of the semester. My name is Dr. Philip Phillips, and I'm the Associate Dean of the University Honors College. And uh, Dean Vile and I are glad that all of you are here today. This is, this is always a day to look forward to because we get to hear from some of our students who've recently successfully defended their honors theses. And we, uh, we try to select students from different disciplines uh, to share their experiences with you, uh, to tell you a little bit about the process that they went through and, and tell you about their research and to pass on any wisdom that they may have gained in, in the process. So uh, our first speaker today is Hannah Tybor, who is a public relations major with minors in nonprofit management and organizational communication. Her thesis director was uh, Dr. Tricia Farwell, and her thesis title is Love Makes a Family, a Collection of Adoption Stories. So please join me in welcoming Hannah. Bing. My phone screen illuminated a darkness. A name I didn't recognize appeared on my Facebook Messenger notifications. Who's messaging me so late at night, I wondered, as my head pounded. After turning down my phone brightness, I opened the app and immediately gasped. I didn't recognize the name, but the face, the face was so familiar. In fact, the more I looked, the more I thought that her face looked almost identical to mine. This can't be happening so quickly, I thought, my entire body shaking in disbelief. I read the first few lines of the message. Hannah, I couldn't go to sleep without writing you. I just found out that you may be my daughter. Taking a deep breath, I continued, knowing that my life would never be the same. This is how I ended my 177 page thesis. Um, let's jump back to the beginning though. In January of 2017, I decided that I wanted to embark on a journey. I wanted to know my past. As an adoptee, I felt that there was not necessarily something that I was missing, but there was more for me to know and more for me to learn. So I started, um, I made the decision to search for my birth mother. And that decision led me to being right here in front of you today. I decided that through my adoption journey, I wanted to write more about it and I wanted to learn more about it. And so the concept of my thesis was born. It's called Love Makes a Family, a Collection of Adoption Stories. My family, every member of it, um, were all adopted, all the children. So um, I thought it was a really interesting take, the more adoption literature that I read, how generalized the information on an adoptee was. We're very uh, stereotypical, or we all have the same symptoms, and they very rarely talk about the experience, the home life of an adoptee, and how that relates to their growth and their development. They just label us with all of these problems and issues at hand, and they never really give us any other identity to claim. So if you notice like in the news when there's a shooting happens and the, the person's an adoptee, such as Parkland shooting, that's the first thing they know. The child's an adoptee. They must have this traumatic instance. And I wanted to prove that trauma is not always associated with adoption. And while it sometimes does exist with it, there's other aspects of adoption that so many people don't realize. So that's a basic overview of my project. I wrote um, every single one of my family's adoption stories from birth until where they currently are, stopping at about January of this year. Um, and focusing on whether or not they chose to search, why or why not they chose to search, and just how they're dealing with adoption in general. Um, I thought it was really great to have an oral history of my family because that didn't currently exist, and so I thought it would be a really cool thing to have going back a few years from now, seeing how much we've grown from where we stood at this moment in time. When I initially started this experience, I wasn't really sure what I wanted from it, especially for my, my search for my birth mother. I didn't really know what I wanted. I had no expectations, and I think that's the best way to go into any anything in your life. Um, just personally, I wasn't let down by anything that I found. I wasn't disheartened, but I was really glad with every, uh, really glad about every ounce of information that I came across and everything I learned about from my own family and about myself personally. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my literature review. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are about to start on your thesis journey, but if you do a creative project, they have, of course, a research component. And so I researched some of the most common concepts that uh, adoptees are labeled or they deal with, and a lot of these I do agree with, but I don't think they define the adoptee. So there's such a concept called the primal wound, and this was introduced by Nancy Verrier, who has an adopted child, and she states this wound as the wound being um, initiated when an adoptee is separated from their birth mother. It doesn't matter how long that separation lasts. It doesn't matter if I'm a birth mother, I have a child, and I pass my child to their adopted mother. That moment that it transfers from my familiar arms to the unknown arms of a stranger, their entire environment changes, 
and it changes the entire child's future. And so that, that role plays a huge, um, a, that um, transfer plays a huge role in the adoptee's life throughout the rest of the things I'm going to talk about. So reactive attachment disorder, um, also known as RID, is often seen in children who are adopted at an older age and have experienced several um, instances of abandonment. And this is where they tend to attach to people that they don't have a problem losing rather than people that they have um, like a family member tie because they're more afraid of attaching to that and losing that and feeling that hurt more. There's the concept of dual identities. Every adoptee kind of has two selves, the adopted self and the um, adopted self. And so one was abandoned, but one was chosen. One was rejected and one was loved. And they have to decide how these two roles play into each other. And the adoptees that tend to do the best in life are the ones whose adoptive parents acknowledged both selves and gave room for both selves to grow in both um, aspects of their life to be acknowledged. So I think that's one of the reasons most of the kids in my family, if not all of us, have had a really, really good experience with adoption because our parents did allow us to feel both of those selves, to talk about adoption, to acknowledge our past, and to grow from it and to learn more about it. And the last one is the concept of searching. Um, most adopted children actually don't choose to search until a certain traumatic instant in their life. And I don't mean like tra trauma in a bad way, just something that uproots the normal. So for females, it tends to be when they become pregnant and they realize that, how could I give up this life? And then for males, it tends to be after his adoptive parents have died and he wants to know more about his past and his history. So that just is the general overview. It could have been a thesis in and of itself, but I didn't want it to be, so I just went brief. I'm going to talk a little bit more about story writing. So I started with my parents' story. This is them. They're pretty cute. I wanted to start there because that's where, the, where our family's story starts. My mom, at the age of 16, found out she wasn't going to be able to have children. And at the time, she was like, hmm, no big deal. I don't want children anyways at this point. So it wasn't until later on that when she met my dad and my dad started talking about how he wanted a really big family and he was like really excited to have a big family that she started kind of feeling this guilt about the situation and she wouldn't even tell him. My uh, grandmother actually told him and my dad was like, that's okay, we'll just adopt. And so that's how it came to be. So um, they got married in 84 and they started the adoption process immediately because they wanted a child. Now at this point they were living in New York City and a couple of things about New York, or New York State, a couple of things about New York State is it's a closed adoption state, which means every adoption that occurs, there is no contact once the, the child is left with the birth mother. It's for the protection of the child but mostly for the protection of the birth mother. So finding a birth parent in New York State is pretty much impossible. So they thought that was pretty good, pretty good, because then you have your child and there's not going to be any probably additional consequences. But as I'll explain down the road, there's some problems with all sorts of adoption systems, and they're just things to overcome. So they got married. They started their adoption process and introduce Stephen. He's the one in the white sweater. Um, Stephen was adopted at six months, and his adoption story is, uh, is heartbreaking, in my opinion. Um, he was adopted at six months old, and for the first six months of his life, he stayed in his crib because his birth mom thought he looked too much like his birth father and didn't want to hold him. And so the first few years of a child's life are imperative to their development, and when you're not held, you don't function cognitively the way you were. My mom remembers when she got Stephen, he was dirty and he was silent. She said, I've never heard such a quiet baby because he had learned at a young age that if I cry, nothing happens, so why should I cry? So he was really quiet. Of course, he did um, a couple years into his adoption, he did start coming into his own. He became a very inquisitive child, um, almost a little bit reckless in a sense. And as he got older, he's very open about his story, so I'm not showing anything he wouldn't want you guys to know already. He started um, battling really hard with uh, drug and alcohol abuse. And he eventually decided to go into the military. He was uh, discharged from the military, and he spent several years in rehab. Today, um, Stephen says he's been clean for about two or three years now. He works a regular um, job. He drives for Lyft, and he's content with that. And if you ask him, do you want to meet your birth mother? Do you want to meet or search? Or do you think adoption's played any role in your life? He'll say, he'll say no. He doesn't care about adoption. He thinks maybe it, it has some effects on his neurological disorders that he's been tested for. Other than that, every decision he claims is his own and is nothing adoption related. And he doesn't want to meet his birth mother. He's, um, I would say, borderline bitter. He wouldn't admit that personally. But I just think he, he sees what life is, and he'll tell you 100% that he's a Tiber. He fits in with the Tibers, and he doesn't want to be any other way. Um, Zachary came along next, but before Stephen and Zachary, um, there was two babies that were lost. And so what, hap what happens in adoption is, in a private adoption, it's arranged through your attorneys. Through an adoption, um, 
agency, there's a lot, lot of safety, but a private adoption, there's not. So my parents adopted Stephen through a private adoption, and then they had tried to adopt two more through that private adoption, and both times the adoptions failed because the birth mother chose to take the child back. Um, with Zachary, they decided to, to join an agency. So Zachary and I were adopted through an agency in New York called Sunrays. And um, Zachary will tell you his adoption story is about indifference. Zachary doesn't care that he's adopted, doesn't care about searching, doesn't care pretty much about a whole lot of things. Zachary's really complacent. That's just how he is. And so when I wrote Zachary's story, I was so bored. I turned it in and I was like, I hate this story. This story is terrible. And Dr. Farr was like, it's not terrible. It's just not you. And I was like, eh, I guess that's true. <laughs> so that was the main struggle I had with his. But if you read his, it's really just like a basic overview of his life because adoption really to him isn't that important. Let's talk about me. Um, I wrote mine in two stories. I wrote a first part and a second part, and the first part focused on um, me being adopted up until the role of where we adopted my sisters, and then the second part focused mainly on my search. And the one I want to talk about is my search. Um, when you write, I am a very emotional writer, and so as I was doing this, this was happening in live time as I'm writing my search for my thesis and I'm searching for my birth mother, and as I would find bits of information out, I had to think to myself, how am I going to write this while still being okay with myself. Like I have to manage my emotions in order to share them properly. And so that was the biggest challenge I faced is knowing what to share and what to keep to myself and what to grow from without telling anybody about. So it was really an interesting endeavor to try to be as honest as I could, but also while still taking care of myself. Um, so after my first story, we talk about, um, I do a story from five different perspectives, or six different perspectives, everybody but Stevens, and we talk about going to get my two youngest sisters, Elise and Emma. So it has everything in there from our Skype calls to the first time we saw them, to finding out they were going to be adopted, to showing up at their orphanage in Taiwan, and looking across the basketball net and seeing my two sisters sitting in a courtyard, but we weren't able to see them yet. It has pretty much all the details of their story, what they've told us, what we knew. Um, so it, it tells going to get them, and Elise is the one in the gray and Emma's the one in the pink, in case you didn't know which two were adopted. They're from Taiwan. Um, further information, sorry. So Elisa's story focused a little bit on the Taiwan culture and her missing it. Elisa and Emma are very different. Elise misses Taiwan. She did really well in Taiwan. She was really popular. You know, she had a, a really cute boyfriend, but she won't want anybody to know that because she was young. You know, she, she had everything that you could have in an orphanage, and she really thrived there. Um, and when she came to America, she faced, as an older child learning English, faced a little bit more of the learning delays. But I think most of it was personified by the fact that her younger sister had no challenges picking up English. So she went really, really fast, and where Elise was just normal, she struggled. And so um, it talks about a little bit of that and how she's overcome it. But Elise is incredibly gifted um, artistically and musically, which are two things that Emma doesn't necessarily have. So it's been really unique to see her excel at those, but also to still rely on the Taiwanese culture, the Taiwanese food, hanging out, um, still speaking the language. Um, as for Emma, Emma's story was the worst. I turned in like the first draft and Dr. Farr was like, rewrite it completely. And I was like, I don't want to. Um, I wrote Emma's story from my perspective initially because she doesn't want to talk about adoption. And so for me to sit there and say, I don't want to talk about adoption seemed really lame to me because I'm writing a story about adoption. But I had to do it because that's what, Emma, that's what Emma says. So most of Emma's story is talking about how she's American. If you go to the doctor, my mom put Asian on her ethnicity because she's Asian. And she goes, no, mom, I'm Caucasian. And I was like, mm. <laughs> OK. So she's just, she's just she's American 100%. She doesn't want to remember Taiwan. She doesn't want to think about it. She doesn't like talking about adoption. She'll, when you ask her about it, she'll just like ignore the question and move on with her life. So that's just how Emma is. She's still growing. She's only um, 13, so she's got a lot of life left to live and a lot of things to work through on her own. But um, it's been really unique to see that story develop and try to write that from a, her perspective of not wanting to talk about it. So since I'm almost running out of time, in conclusion, um, I did not think I would write this much. When I tackled my thesis project, I was like, few short stories, no big deal, it'd be like maybe 60, 70 pages. No, it was 177 pages. All the stories averaged between 15, I think, and like 22 pages. So I, I wrote way more than I anticipated. Um, but it was really good. I don't think anybody in our family has ever sat down with one another and said, you know, why do you want an adopter? Why didn't you like being adopted? Or what do you wish would have happened differently? And I got to hear all those perspectives from each one of my family members. I learned more about my adoption than I knew. I thought I was immediately transferred from my birth mother to my mom. And the more we dug into it, it turns out 
I wasn't. There was like a three day period where we have no idea where I was. So there's that. But like I learned a lot of unique aspects about my family and I learned one really important thing, which is the title of my thesis, that love really does make us a family. We don't have flesh and blood to tie us together, but we have a really unique experience that ties us together. And through that experience, we're able to bond really well. It's as if they were always my siblings. Um, and they are my siblings. I don't have uh, two families. I have one family, and it's the family that I was adopted into. And so that's pretty much it. I think we have the time to do so. So if, if uh, any of you have questions or comments for Hannah, please go ahead and, and ask some questions. Yeah. yeah. Are these written like short stories or are they written like oral histories with like the questions and stuff? They're short stories. So I decided to leave out all um, research information in it. So in the no front of my thesis, it says just a note for the um, journalistic endeavor of this research, all of the citations and so on and so forth that you would find in a normal research are left out to make it seem more like a short story. But they were conducted as an oral history. So it was just sitting down and asking questions and then writing my perspe or their perspective from me, if that makes sense. But there's no question. You're not going to see like, why did you do this? And that It'll start from um, as close to birth as I can get, or birth, and then it'll go on up until moderate, modern day. In their perspectives? In their perspectives. Yeah. You think your, uh, your family got a lot closer through this process? Um, I think I learned a lot more about my two younger sisters. Um, my two older brothers, I've kind of always known how they felt about adoption, and so that was... I just kind of knew it was going, going to be going to the interviews, but I knew with Elise and Emma that it was going to be a little bit harder to get that information out. So I really, actually really enjoyed it because I got to sit down and ask not just adoption questions, but I just threw some other ones in there too to make it seem more like a, a fun conversation. And I actually learned a lot about them that they wouldn't have shared normally. So I really enjoyed um, learning about that. As far as the family as the in entirety, I'm not sure all of us have gotten that much closer because I did in individual interviews. I didn't want uh, multiple multiple perspectives skewing the information. So I would think we've gotten closer. Those of us that have at least read it, and me and my younger sisters, my two older brothers, of course, are moved in a little bit farther away, so they haven't been as involved as much in the process. Yeah. Um, only because you mentioned in the beginning, how did it go when you were contacted on Facebook by, is it your biological? Mm -hmm. um, would you be really offended if I decided not to share that? That's okay, <laughs> thank you. Questions? Could you could you comment on um, the benefits of, of reading your project if you are uh, a family considering adopting or if you yourself are an, an adoptee? What what are some of the benefits? Because I know that you envisioned that when you were writing this. So a lot of adoption literature focuses either on like one aspect of our adoption. And it's usually not inclusive, so it either focuses on like international or domestic, or infant or child, or you know just the various aspects of adoption. It's usually not cumulative. And I thought when I first proposed my thesis idea is that my family is so unique because we have all of it. We have um, infant, we have newborn, we have child, we have international, we have domestic adoption, just represented within the five children here at various ages. So we have a really good data to pull from, and we have all reacted differently to adoption. So I figured as I was writing this, because there's nothing that I could find out there similar to this adoption literature, that if it was to eventually one day be published, that it could help showcase not only the hope that you see with adoption, because adoption is always, oh, it's so beautiful, like you have a family, how great is that? But there's also some downsides to adoption that people don't ever want to think about. Like you have to, to acknowledge the love and the beauty of adoption, you have to acknowledge first what happened to the adoptee. And so I wanted to take both of those perspectives and combine them together, and I tried to do that as honestly as I could without being too harsh on either side, if that makes sense. Thank you, Hannah.